Good people of a great nation is a pleasure to welcome you to the first discussion segment on development focus with Gideon Joe on ITV. We'll be discussing election, electoral reform, and electoral integrity. Uh, it seems like a rhyme, but it's not a rhyme. Uh, they mean different things. And anyway, the person I brought to dissect this is also a linguist. Uh, aside from being a poet, aside from being an author, aside from being a journalist, aside from being a governance expert, aside from being a lawyer. Have I said anything? <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, meet Obo Efanga, the current incumbent resident electoral commissioner in River State for Independent National Electoral Commissioner. Obo, you're welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you. Yes. <laughs> they, they, they said, they said uh, you know, uh, big things come in small packets. <laughs> uh, if it, when I advertise uh, that you will be coming on my show, people are like, we go back to this very handsome dude. <laughs> uh, they, they saw your handsome. They never know that you are a combination of brain and beauty, if I can say that. <laughs> you know, but tell us a bit about yourself. I know it. I know you belong to Lions Club, you went to Hope Water, um, you are a lawyer, you are a poet, you are a journalist, you are a governance expert, but who exactly is Obo Efanga? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Well, I just, um, I'll just say I'm a Nigerian. Um, I'm a typical Nigerian. I like saying that because um, when people say, oh, no, but this isn't how we are going to I say, well, we've been seeing. So I'm just, um, in, like any other Nigerian, I, I, I was born here. I have only one citizenship. I've lived all my life here, apart from a brief period that I studied outside the country. Uh, so I leave Nigeria. I am Nigerian. Um, so um, that's about it. You've mentioned I'm a lawyer. I'm Your a father lawyer. was a teacher, I guess. Yes, my father was a teacher. Um, at Obuadel? At Obuadel. Um, hey, interesting. Yeah. Actually, my grandfather went to Obuadel. <laughs> my father went to Obuadel. <laughs> and you also went to Obuadel. <laughs> uh, interesting. Yeah. So, um, and um, I think that um, there are lots of opportunities and um, uh, God has blessed me with... Uh, having some of those opportunities and uh, giving my best shot uh, when those opportunities come in. And um, sometimes you see things happen and you just... Sometime last year, I, was, I came across a book that was a book gift to my grandfather. Mm. And that book gift was given to him when he, he used to work in the customs. Mm. And one of his duty position, uh, posts was in Port Harcourt. And it was given to him by the Calabar community in Port Harcourt when he was being transferred from Port Harcourt. Mm. And when I looked at the book, I think that was 1940-something. And I said, many, many years later, his grandson is in the same Port Harcourt as his duty post, reversed as his duty post. Mm. So. <laughs> Interesting. So, so you, growing up, what, what was it like? Why the choice of law? as a course of study in the university? Well, I've always been this member of the community who has a lot of questions. And um, in the decisions, why was this decision taken? And sometimes I go out of my way to protect the interests of others. If I thought somebody was not well treated, I will ask questions and all that. And um, somehow, growing up, people kept saying, this guy, this this boy, the way he's behaving, <laughs> he'll be a lawyer. Okay. And um, I started being interested in being a lawyer. And um, I also loved writing. Mm. And um, I ended up studying mass communications first before I eventually studied law. Interesting. I didn't know that about you. So you first did first degree in mass communication? No, not first degree. I did a national diploma okay. uh, in mass communications from the Polytechnic Calabar. Calabar, before you went to... Before I went to, to Unicam. Unica. Okay. All right. Anyway, um, this is not about personality show, but I always want to get a brief of my, of my guests so that people can follow through what the trajectory of their life and career has been. Um, enough said. Um, you, you, you moved into... Uh, journalism at some point yeah 
Then you I started work as a journalist. Uh, as a journalist, yeah. okay. Before I went on to study law. Mm -hmm. Then you studied law. And even after studying law, practiced for a few years, I still found myself doing journalism stuff. Our path crossed at Action It. You yes. were governance team lead at some governance point. Governance programs manager. Pro program manager at yes. Action It. So how did you leave um, journalism for um, development work? Well, you see, what you study is to give you the knowledge. Mm. What you do is to apply the knowledge you've studied. So I studied mass communications, I studied law, I had practiced both, and uh, an opportunity came for me to work in the development sector, and I took it. Um, I actually started with uh, Gender and Development Action. Okay, Gada in Lagos. Uh, in Lagos. That's uh, uh, honorable. <laughs> yes, yes, yes sir. I started with her before, and eventually I worked with uh, uh, CLEAN, Center uh, for Law Enforcement okay. Education, now CLEAN Foundation, sure. but I was handling the the network and police reform in Nigeria, mm. the network. No problem. Yes. And then, after that, I now went back fully into journalism. Um, I, I, I worked with New Age newspapers as general counsel and editorial board member. Uh, that is where I did much of my journalism, maintaining a column. Eventually, I now got into Action Aid. Uh, will you describe your life as being very eventful? Well, yes, there are a lot of. I can tell a lot of stories about... Okay, uh, let's pass on the story. Um, <laughs> the viewers, if, if you can... I mean, my, my PD, if you can zoom in on this, these are the two books uh, this gentleman has uh, written. Um, he has just gifted me these two books as my New Year gift, and I really cherish this. I'm going to devour it at my... Uh, spare time. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's also an author, not just an author by mouth. He has produced two books. I have done three, so he's still lagging behind on that. <laughs> Obo, let's come into election. Yes. Um, what's your perception of election in Nigeria? I like to put it this way, that the election is what the Nigerian people want it to be. How do you mean? Okay. So, what leads to, what comes out as election is a reflection of the entirety of the Nigerian people in terms of what they want out of governance. Because it's an election that you decide who you want to govern you. Yeah, that's the leadership recruitment process. Good. Now, there's the electoral commission mm. that manages the process. Um, I've followed elections in Nigeria since from the Second Republic, uh, when we were still in the secondary school. I, mm. I followed that up to this moment. Mm. And um, we will agree that there's been incremental improvement in the conduct of election. It's becoming more sophisticated. Um, we are cutting out those things that uh, were issues about the credibility of the entire process. But there's an extent to which the Electoral Commission and even technology can go. Eventually, it is human beings who run this process. It is, this process is created for human beings, and it is human beings who use the process, who use the opportunities created. So if you have in a community where the people have made up their mind that they are not going to have a credible election, there'll be so much, there's there'll be little that the Electoral Commission and all the managers of election can do to ensure that happens. Because on election day, let's look at it in a typical polling unit. How many people are there as the people conducting the election? For a typical polling unit in Nigeria, you will have four persons, electoral officials, the presiding officer, the, uh, and then the three assistant presiding officers, who are young people, youth corps members, who don't come from that community and they've come there to conduct the election because you also have the security uh, officials there. But the core of the people who are going to participate in that election are members of that community there who know the terrain. Yeah. So it is also important that they come in with the intention that this is a good election. Otherwise, you're going to have problems. Mm. And even when I want to acknowledge the fact that 
a lot of times the community people who participate in this election are not only acting on their own they are also acting the scripts of some influential persons that is the politicians who have an interest in the outcome of the election mm. so um this 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 brings us to we've been doing elections since 1923 after the Clifford constitution of 1922 uh, so we are almost um 90 something years into our electoral democracy so to speak 29 of those years were under the military junta so we discount that if we bring that out we've been doing election for like over 60 years why is it that our election is still suboptimal. I, I mean, you've talked about uh, influencers, political influencers or gatekeepers. Uh, uh, is that actually the, the, the key challenge we have in election? Mm. Or there are more? Well, it's actually the price. Okay, why, when you elect somebody, what is the price you are giving the person? Leadership. So what comes with leadership in Nigeria? The stakes are too high. Mm. So when somebody comes in as uh, president, as governor, as chair, uh, chairperson of a local government area, or as legislators at any of those levels, suddenly the opportunities change. A lot of power, a lot of uh, uh, influence, a lot of uh, 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 um, wealth comes with that and so people who are going to do so many things to get him there now if you compare him with an election let us say if you had um, classmates maybe old uh, uh, old students mm. of a group um, who come together and there are no stakes in it if you are going to coordinate that group you are going to serve selflessly uh, there's no money huge money uh, for you to manage very few people would be interested in that. But it's still an election. Why don't people fight so much to be uh, uh, leaders of the uh, old students' association at that mm. level? Because there's not much stake. You, you have to so even spend your own money exactly. to serve the... But the higher the stakes, the more the interest. And so, people are going to throw in a lot of things just to get in there. Yeah, yeah. So, so people have been saying, oh, you know what? We need to de-emphasize the uh, money politics. But how do you do that? Um, the, the salary of public official, even a governor, is less than a millionaire, from what they told us. I mean, they said their salary is about 750000 in a month. The National Assembly just came out on recently, uh, President of the Senate, Amen Allah, and said, the salary of a senator is about a million naira, but they get 13 million for uh, what do they call is it uh, um, running cost for their whatever. Do you think this money or these wages is sufficient to kill a man if not for influence peddling and corruption? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, <laughs> you, you've said it. It's not just about, uh, there are a lot of things that come with public office and um, in a place like ours where um, people who occupy public office can influence quite a lot of things. Uh, they have a lot of powers, even the ones assigned to them by the law and the ones that uh, citizens and others have willingly or unwillingly acceded to them. Uh, so they, they even... Um, they may even run, run shots over others and uh, there's not much done to resist that and so people will say things like oh, well it's the person's turn wait for your turn and you can do it the way you want it yeah but, but, but why i'm emphasizing this because i've had this whole argument i've also been part of that proud to now to say oh let's reduce the cost of um, uh, the, the salaries and the monuments of these public officials but when they tell you they hand less than a million naira. You and I know in development sector we hand we have people who are not even country directors, who are just program managers who earn as much as one point five million or two million as monthly wages. Yeah. And these people claim 
and they have evidence to show that their salary is just I mean for a government. Maybe there's more to it than, than so, just so the salary. So that is the, exactly the pressure point that will people kill a meme if somebody is investing maybe 10 billion to run for governorship. But if you calculate 750,000 or let me say they have even increased it to 1 million as a senator if you hand that consistently for four years that you are supposed to be in office, or for eight years, you can recoup ten billion that you have spent. It then shows that there is more to public office mm -hmm. that draws people to get involved in all manner of sharp practices and malpractices to win than just the salaries and 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 uh, and uh, maybe even extra codes. Because I'm not sure your yes, extra so, codes will so be... So I think that is something that the development experts need to uh, focus on and, and find out what exactly is going on there. And also journalists. Like, it's something that, uh, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to do that. But, 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 that. but, 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 but for, for instance, let, let's take an issue of... You, you said something about influence peddling. Yeah. Um, somebody is a governor. Mm. You don't have to steal. You sign a preparation bill of one trillion, like the governor of Lagos State now, his budget as a governor will be in excess of one trillion. You are what contract and does all manner of things. You can make somebody a millionaire. But there are processes for awarding contracts. But that is the issue. There are processes, but if you follow what the Acoustic Corruption Agents have been doing, you find out that, yes, People have also been circumventing those processes. Mm -hmm. Then there are agencies that are responsible for ensuring that that doesn't happen. Or when it happens, that people uh, get So, So, the, what's your perception of visual of security votes for governor? Well, that needs to be, um, that, that needs to be analyzed again. What exactly was it meant for? What was the intention for it? And um, not only that, how is it being used? Perhaps there is a problem with how it is used mm -hmm. and the accountability part of it. Um, but uh, I, I think the, the, the experts would need to tell us when this all started, what was the reason for that, and um, how best can it be managed? And uh, if it should still continue, uh, how best it, it should be managed? Because I'm drawing analogy around your illustration or the anecdote you shared earlier. Why are people not killing and maiming themselves to be coordinator of their WhatsApp group <laughs> for host student, host student association? Or even in Lions Club that yeah. you belong, or Rotaract. Yeah. You do hear gunshots. You don't hear anybody, anybody <laughs> getting <laughs> burnt and killed. You know, interesting, you, you mentioned Lions Club and Rotary Club, and people said when you want a term of one year, Okay. One calendar year, as a governor. starting from July to June of the next year. Okay, and they even spend their money. That's it. So, 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 you know, that's the point I mean. Because we need to unpack why is elections a do or die in Nigeria. You, you did say that election in Nigeria is um, as the people want it, yeah. and you talked about influencers, political influencers within yes. the communities who want certain things done yeah. to ensure their victory. And we are trying to see why the desperation. That's the, that's what that's the because that's the that's the thing that. I mean, your chairman, Professor Mamu Yakubu, said, "Look, with all the laws, all the technologies, if we don't have attitudinal change, nothing is going to change." Exactly. So we have. We, we, I mean, the commission have done its own bit, bringing in technology and all of that. But you see. What happened in, uh, in, uh, in November? I think, were you in Anambra? No, I was not. Okay. Uh, you, you know, uh, in Anambra, with all the, uh, we will not allow election to hold in Hiala, and uh, there was no election. So why that desperation? If it is a call to service, I think that is the crux of the matter. Why election is so expensive? Why people have to go? I've seen, I've read a story of somebody who went who carried the uh, hard drugs and was caught. And he said to the NDLA officials that the previous election he tried to contest, he lost because he didn't have enough resources to beat the 
person that eventually won. And this time around, he was trying to raise money. And his own way of raising money is to carry drugs <laughs> <laughs> so that he will have sufficient money mm -hmm. to win uh, in the following uh, election. So I, I'm, I'm just wondering, because we're talking election, an election in Nigeria is gradually becoming a routine. Yeah. And you see the delinkage in terms of voter turnout. Every election is like it is reducing. Which then means that people are not appreciating the fact that this is leadership recruitment process. So that's what I want you to shed light on. Why? When you're talking about voter turnout, um, there are different ways to look at it. Perhaps before now, the voter turnout we had weren't really a reflection of the actual voting because we did not have situations where, with a form of accreditation now, it is difficult for you to have votes that are not based on accreditation. But there was a time in this country that you could just inflate figures in the name of votes. Mm. So by the time we are now using technology to ensure that the uh, real people are registered as voters, and on election day, real people who have been accredited actually vote, and the votes are counted, you also find a situation where you now have the, you, you can now say that you have what looks like the reality of the number of people who have turned up to, to vote. But I also don't rule out the fact that there are many people who would have wanted to vote and have not come out to vote because of how elections go on election day, violence, and um, even also um, if people feel that people who have been in government already prior to now uh, are not uh, delivering on, 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 on what they expect. So they may just think that, oh, well, what's the point wasting my time? Uh, whoever gets in there will still have the same uh, kind of situation. Okay. Um, away from that, what's your perception or what kind of electoral reform do you think we should initiate? Well, we are, um, INEC has been reforming uh, over the years, different ways, and um, more reformations will come up as the trend also grew. But I think that um, what I tell people is that what we do in terms of election now, in terms of quality, trying to bring in quality, is about the highest anywhere you can see, you can go, because of the technology we use in terms of uh, registration. If you, um, in the last few months, we found out that um, the technology we now use for the registration is such that by the time we, uh, we go through the records, before we produce the voter's card, we are able to find out those who have tried to register multiple times. So in an Ambra election, there were 62,000 plus attempts to register more than once. And so 62,000 supposedly new registrants uh, 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 were disallowed to be on the voters' register. And in FCT, election to the area council elections will be here uh, next month. Um, and a similar thing was also done and one third of the people who came in to register are fresh. We were able to identify that they were already on the voters register. And so that's... What, what's responsible for that? Because now uh, we have both the fingerprint and the... Uh, uh, yeah, I know. That's using the, the by mother voter. So so what, but why, why are people... Why, I mean, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's something that the commission needs to look into. Why are people still engaging in multiple registration if they are aware they will be found out and it will be useless and it can disqualify them from no, being on the voters' room? Many people don't know that the music has changed because they have done that in the past and it worked for them. So even when we tell them, don't do it, we'll find out. Many people still, well, let's just give it a try. Well, if, they, if, if, if we are found out, well, that's okay. But what if we are not found out? But so far, we've seen that this current technology works better than what we had in the past. And so we tell people this. And there are people out of ignorance who attempt to register afresh. But we let them know that if you are registered before, anywhere in the country, just let us know. We can do a transfer for you to where you now want to vote. Or if you lost your card, we can produce a new card. Or if the information in the previous registration is different, you can just update the information, and we do all that. Do, but, do, but we also have 
We also have uh, uh, the influencers who mobilize this person, especially the young people, just go and register. And these people register, come and register multiple times. But like I said, by the time we do the screening, before producing the cards, we'll identify this. Okay, so what, 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 what does the commission do uh, if you are found to have engaged in multiple registration or underage registration, which are uh, criminal offense according to our electoral acts? Yes. So what does the commission, do they just um, weed them out or, or is there anything? Well, like, well, like you said, the law already makes it a criminal offense, mm -hmm. which means those people are subject to be prosecuted. But Jide, how are you going to prosecute 62,000 people in one state? 62,000 in an umbrella state alone. And in um, um, uh, FCT, I said one third of those who registered. So it's about, I think it's about 14,000, uh, 16,000 attempted multiple registrants. How do you prosecute all that number? You need the, the, the primary. You the, possibly need tax force. Exactly. <laughs> the primary responsibility of INEC is to ensure that it will conduct election, to ensure that people come. So if uh, come votes, the votes are counted and the results are, uh, are announced. These other things are ancillary to our responsibilities, prosecuting uh, people who have. So that can't take the front uh, 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 seat in our work. So what do you do? You, do, you, do you still produce their card or you disqualify no, no, we them? Don't, from we don't produce their card. Because they are already registered. So let's say somebody had registered in, say, 2014 or even 2019 and now wants to register again. Once we see that there is already a registration, the new one is discountenance. So but they, we can use the old one. We can still go with the old one. With the old one, yes. okay. Um, now, let, let, you, you have talked about um, one aspect of areas of reform. What other electoral reform measures? Maybe we should calibrate it. Um, reform can be administrative, it can be legal. Yeah. Uh, right now, the civil society organization is policing the legal reform in terms of uh, having a new electoral act. And you know what has, uh, the fate has befallen that. But at the level of the electoral management body, INEC, which you are a commissioner on that, what kind of reforms have been initiated since you joined the, the team? Well, there are, there are many. I've mentioned um, I, um, the bimodal voter the bimodal accreditation yes. system. And the um, also the fact that uh, we take actions to ensure that the elections are credible. So let me give an instance. Um, before now, uh, we've had situations in legislative elections, for instance, all you need to win an election is to score the majority of votes, valid votes cast in the election. Mm. So it got to a stage that people were deliberately on an election day. We had that in River State, for instance, my first election in River State in August of 2018. Um, we conducted a, a by-election to the, uh, one of the seats in the State House of Assembly. Out of 142 polling units, by the time we took count, election had been effectively disrupted in at least a hundred wow. polling units with violence. There was widespread violence. So in at least a hundred polling units out of 142, election had been uh, um, disrupted. Somebody could have said, okay, whatever results you have in the other place, just count it and declare a winner. But you see, that would have enabled people who use violence to achieve victory. We didn't even bother to see what was the result coming in from those places. All we did was we had to suspend the process. And, and eventually, this was August 2018, uh, general elections were coming up in February, March 2019. That seat eventually uh, was not occupied until we had the uh, fresh elections. So the, the commission is also taking steps to ensure that people don't benefit from their wrongdoings in situations like this. Um, there are other uh, uh, reforms that have happened. Now, we now allow people to, you can actually register or start the process of registering with uh, uh, your phone 
mm. from the pre-registration pre-registration um. and apart from fresh registrants every other thing you need to do you can actually do without coming to INEC if you have a smartphone if you want to update your information you can do that without coming to INEC you can make correction to your name um, you can make correction to your address you can request to vote in a different location from where you were assigned to vote you can do all this without coming to INEC and then we will produce a new card mm -hmm. and then you come and pick uh, uh, and how robust is your ICT facility now? Uh, because a lot of people are saying that, look, uh, we, I, I put in for transfer of my voter, voter, voting, voter stand details and uh, months after, no response, no action taken. No, no. Okay, now, remember this current uh, continuous voter registration started... Um, June 28th. June. Last year. Last year. So we've had... Last year we had two quarters. We just started a third quarter, which is uh, this year. Um, so at the end of each quarter, we have the figures of people who have done different things, fresh registration, transfers, and all that, and we've done the approval. So for each of these applications, I said, in each state, the resident electoral commissioner finally approves it, and we do this with approval. We've com uh, approved all, all of those. It is now left for the headquarters in doing after doing the screening to ensure that there's no multiplicity of registration then cards will be produced for the people to pick so we had to uh, prioritize anambra because it, there was election there that was done in anambra and the fct now um the cards for those who had done that um, i'm sure it's ready by now because we have to pick them up to be able to vote in february so for the other places too we are going to because uh, election is not coming up until some uh, in next year, but all the cards, um, all the information will be updated and all the cards will be ready for the voters. It, 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 uh, as a member of the commission, if you are to name areas in need of improvement, uh, what, uh, uh, which areas do you think the commission still needs to improve upon? Well, it's um, it's in the use of technology, and we are actually doing that uh, a lot. I also believe that um, we can cut off a lot of cost if um, mm -hmm. collation is done right from the polling unit and then it goes to the final point. We'll cut off the idea of uh, after an uh, election, is, is, uh, votes are counted in a polling unit, you go to a collation center, a ward collation center, from there you go to local government collation center, and then you go to the state coalition center and then go to the national coalition center for the presidential election. All that processes and manual, you have to read them manually, record them by hand, move them. It's something that uh, we can cut off. And if the law allows it, uh, INEC is in a position to do that. So uh, what's the position of the commission in terms of electronic transmission of results and electronic voting? as we prepare well, for 2023. Well, well, the commission is in support of, 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 of both, if the, if the law permits us. Uh, yeah, but, but you, you, the commission have requested for $305 billion for, the, for procurement and preparation for 2023. It has received, but how prepared, I mean, you are a member of the commission, you have routine meetings. How prepared is the commission for, uh, are we likely going to see electronic voting in 2023? No, I don't think that uh, even the, what is being passed, uh, uh, is being proposed in the a new uh, act, talks about electronic voting. It's the electronic transmission of... Uh, uh, but there is, there is, there is already electronic voting uh, uh, purportedly approved by 2015 amendment to the act. Well, then uh, we the, need to work on the... The technology we need to get the technology right i know that there was a time the commission actually received um, um uh, proposals from vendors of different uh, yeah over 40 machines. vendors yes. and sugar and, yes, last so, year so we need to be you see we need to be sure that we can get that running in all the polling units before uh, you do it but i also think uh, it's important to let people know because a lot of people who talk about electronic voting uh, interpret that to mean that you can sit at home yeah internet and voting vote. they are, they like mba they, they, they are different things the electronic voting that is used in elections 
across the world where they use it is the one that you go you still have to go to a polling unit yeah. and there's a machine to where you now vote. A touch screen. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, I um I understand that uh, uh Kaduna State government yeah, is for the local twice government now. Election, 2018 and, and also 2022. Saw it, uh, in Venezuela. Okay. Uh, that's what uh, they use. So by the time voting ended in the polling units and the results were um, uh, counted there, they were just uh, seamlessly transmitted to the final point. And we, so, we just moved to the final point. So it, uh, let, let, let me get you very clearly. Part of your reform was that we can, do, we can reduce cost and time of uh, collation of results by collapsing some of the collation points. Um, do you think that would be expedient, given the uh, possibility of error, or that we should still have this collision and on top have electronic transmission? Which one do you, or do you think we should do away with manual collision and then focus? I think that by the time you finish counting votes in the polling units, every other thing you do is just adding up the figures you've already found in the That's true. Unit. There is a like there is more likelihood of error if it is manually collated from point to point. That is where people before now would want to go and influence and add up figures. But because you now have the the polling unit result already preserved now in an electronic copy, you can't do all those again. So what I'm saying is, if you've already had the, the polling unit result in an electronic format, what's the point still going to sit down and bring this electronic format and then write it down, calculate by hand, when uh, technology can all, has already helped you? If you have it in the electronic format, then just transmit it to whatever level. But what, what if there are errors? Uh, because uh, transmission, electronic transmission, yes. But you don't forget about what... Um, we are taught in computer literacy class about gigo, garbage in garbage. So, so, so that error would have been co committed already at the polling unit counting. Mm -hmm. So even if you do a manual collation, you are not going to count what was already But how do you then review if a result was wrongfully transmitted? If I want to put, uh, say that somebody scored 40 votes and I put 400 votes, how do you retrieve at what uh, point at the polling unit? at the polling unit that's what i'm saying at the polling unit everybody is there when you've counted and the but agents, not everybody will see where you are transmitting no, no, but the agents of the parties would have signed up on the results yeah okay and at that point you remember what we do now is that it is a photo of that result sheet that's the that yeah, that 60 yes is 60 that is preserved no, no, the... the, the uh, Polling unit result. Yes, that is... There's a photo of it that is preserved. Once you've taken a photo... That, that's the world that I make just with IRED now. Yes. And, uh, Good. Where so you what can. I'm saying is, when you've already preserved that, if you still transmit the figures, this other preservation would be there to show if there's an error. Okay. Because this one is has been signed off. Okay. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, 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 let, let's look at electoral integrity. There are different, across the election value chain, yeah. tell us where there are possibility, and I'm not limiting this to INEC, yeah. uh, they're across the electoral value chain, yeah. where are the possibility of electoral fraud being committed? So many levels. It even starts from the political parties when they, they have their primaries. Yeah, primaries. As you would see now, most of the problems with the election emanate from the conduct of primaries, not even the main election. Mm. So a lot of instances that go to court or the tribunal is that this person shouldn't have been the candidate of the political party or this mm. person wasn't qualified to, be, uh, to stand the election at all. So that's one area that um, you could have fraud. You could also have fraud at the polling unit level. If there is a compromise by the people involved to do the wrong thing, then it will, it, it will go through. But to the extent that at the polling unit, all the political parties that are part of the election are entitled to have um, uh, their agents there. So we think that that reduces 
the possibility of manipulating at that time. But we know in practice that it is possible for a powerful political party or individual to be able to manipulate all the people in that at that level. Okay. So that happens there. There could also be a manipulation at the collision point, which is why I said the fewer collision points you have, the better for the system. Okay. And technology can help with that. Okay. What about the the um, at the level of um, continuous voter registration or voter registration? Yes. The issue of multiple registration does it come under electoral fraud? Oh, sure. Because okay. it's, it's, it's the entire uh, 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 spectrum of election. So, so then, then there's something that was curious. When the commission created the additional 57,000 polling units, making our polling units to come to 176,000 plus last year, so about, in about 40 places, the commission have to relocate polling units from shrine, from... Uh, traditional rulers, uh, enclave, and all of that. How did that happen? Uh, you know? Well, over time, um, elections have been conducted in places that are open to the public. That's the standard. Um, it could also happen that over time, some of those places have been encroached and now become used for other things. It's also possible that some people influential had over time uh, decided to site, get a, a polling unit sited in places where that were not appropriate. So at every given time, INEC tries to find out those places that are uh, polling units that are not properly sited and they get them corrected. And this is something that is done at the state level. Just that this time, the figures were shared for across the country what was done in the process of creating new polling units and uh, uh, citing polling units where they ought to be and removing the ones that were not there. And I tell you that uh, this was very important because anybody who goes to vote should have unfettered access to the place to vote. So if you have in some places some shrines, of course there's restriction, and even in some palaces, uh, they could tell you that, oh, well, you can't come to this place to mm. vote because... For whatever reason, too, we had to, and even religious places, places of religious worship, we also avoid having problems. So, so let, let, let's, let's talk about your experience now. You were in, in governance, you were in development sector, then you got appointed into the, into the public service. What has been your high points and low points? Uh, compare and contrast your background in media and civil society and now in public service, does anything, did anything shock you in the last five years? Well, to the extent that even as a development person, we're working with government agencies, and even as journalists, we were reporting what we saw in government. So um, it wasn't so much of a shock for me. There are things I expected, um, but I tried to also find creative means of ensuring that things were done properly. And one of which is for staff to recognize that the little thing you think you're doing, so even if you are a cleaner, that how you clean could determine, could affect the outcome for the commission, even in an election. Because if the place is not properly clean, then the staff who work there may fall ill, then it would affect the quality of output. So it's actually to link what people do to the purpose of the organization that they work in. For a lot of people, they just see it um, like, I just go to work and come back. They may not be able to link what they do with the bigger picture of what the organization does. So one of the things we also do is to have training for staff and let staff know, this thing we talk about election, which you are part of. If somebody asks you simple questions about what is going on, continuous voter registration, would you be able to explain to your neighbor what this is all about? Or if your neighbor says, this is the problem I have, would you be able to explain to them? So we try to, to do that. Um, there are other instances that um, I was surprised at, the attitude of, 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 of some staff, but uh, we're, we're working on that. And one of the things I also 
where I have served, I've also tried to do is to try to at least be friendly with the staff, try to know more about them. So for the staff uh, that work in, um, in the state where I am, I call each one of them on their birthdays. Mm -hmm. So I have a list of, I'm interested in their birthdays, I call, one, call them on their birthdays. And some of the feedback I get is that they are not used to the boss uh, calling a staff unless the staff has done something wrong. Mm -hmm. So if they say to a, a staff ordinarily that the wreck was looking for you, they will think they've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. But they find out that that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so um, you've been in Edo and now in River State working as a resident electoral community. If you compare the two environments, how has it been for you? Well, I was in Edo for just nine months and um, there wasn't any election activity. Okay. We were just doing the continuous voter registration. If I'm that was 2018? Yes, was it, from 2017. 2017. Yes, okay. uh, until. April of 2018, when I was posted to River State, but in River State we've conducted elections in River State. So, so, so what, what, what? So, people regard River State as hotspot. Uh, every election uh, hotspot mapping you do, River State is always on top. It's one of the first three in terms of areas where you should not go uh, mess up. Uh, in terms of areas where there is likelihood of election violence. How have you coped uh, in the last four years working in uh, rivers well, and superintending over the elections? It's just to do the right things. I just focus on the work I'm supposed to do. I know what is right and what is wrong, and I focus on doing the right thing. And uh, many people wouldn't like you for that, I must say. Um, when the elections we've conducted, uh, I've been insulted um, at different times by the politicians, and um, I just will be tough. The important thing is that I'm doing the right thing. If um, somebody um, wants to fault me, let them fault me on the conduct. If there's something we've done wrong, then we can address it, um, or um, they can take actions. But a lot of times, people will just dislike you because you are doing the right thing, and by doing the right thing, they don't benefit from it. They would mm -hmm. rather you did things uh, differently, um, the way it suits them. And for a lot of people, unfortunately, for a lot of followers of the politicians, um, they've been brainwashed, so to speak, to think that if the, uh, so, uh, the person they support did not win the election, then the election wasn't free and fair. But that's not always the case. Mm. Mm. Uh, has there been any unpleasant experience you had um, in the course of your duty either in Edo or, Undo, um, Edo or Rivers, in terms of uh, something that made you think, oh, I shouldn't have gotten this job, I, I shouldn't have got involved in this. Uh, has there been any regrettable moment for you since you joined the commission? Not regret, but maybe disappointment that um, given all that we try to do to ensure that elections go on smoothly and are credible, there are some people who are usually bent on doing the wrong thing and um, deliberately, and they wouldn't mind. So, for instance, I talked about the, um, the by-election we had in August 2018. I know the huge amount of money and other resources, human resources, um, that w was invested into that election, and then people just come in and um, uh, uh, cause confusion in the process. For me, I was looking at not just that the election was disrupted, but the huge amount of public resources that has been spent in an election that has now become wasted because some individuals expected things to be done in a part who just wanted to manipulate the system. And that is very wrong. The issue of sabotage has also been alleged in the electoral process. Uh, that some of the staff of the commission are also fifth columnists in a sense. What has been your experience in Rivers? Well, we can't rule that out. So we also are uh, careful with um, how we, 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 we make assignments, uh, assign people to responsibilities. But staff also know that this is where the livelihood is. So if I have to choose between asking a staff to conduct election and an ad hoc staff whom we only know a few weeks of the election 
train the person. We don't know what the person's interest might be. I would always go for the, the staff of the commission. Yes, I know that there are people within the commission who may not um, be ready to do the right thing, but the number would be fewer than if you're looking at people that you don't even know where, where they're coming from or who is influencing them. Uh, because the staff knows that this is where his or her livelihood is, and if he or she is found out, then it means the career is coming to ruins. And there are some of them who have put in so many years that they won't want to throw it uh, away by just... So, so, so in, in your own opinion, as we wind down this conversation, how do you think we can tackle the issue of electoral fraud uh, in the? Or uh, 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 let me put it differently: How do we think? How do you think we can show up, show up, or boost electoral integrity in Nigeria? Well, I've talked about what the commission is doing, you know, in terms of technology. Um, the members of the commission, the uh, the staff of the commission, those who conduct election, also have to carry themselves in with, with a high sense of integrity. That is what will also uh, boost the confidence of the public who come to uh, uh, participate in this. But there's also a lot that needs to be done in terms of uh, voter education and civic education. Uh, because who are these people who manipulate the system, whether they are from outside or within the, uh, uh, the commission? These are ordinary Nigerians who, at the best of times, claim to be very religious. Mm. So what is the what do the religious leaders say to the to the uh, adherents who are involved in this, whether they are politicians seeking office and doing everything wrong just to get office or while in the office trying to manipulate the system, or they are uh, party supporters, or they are uh, voters, or they are people conducting the election. What is the attitude of the society? to people who deliberately want to manipulate the system. So it's, it's a societal issue that we all have to address, you know, uh, uh, wherever we sit. Okay. So um, this, your uh, tour of duty is gradually winding down. What do you think will be your legacy when you finally... Uh, disengage or your tenor ends in the commission, what will you think you'll be remembered for uh, either in any of the places where you have served? Well, um, I think that that would best be said by people who have uh, worked with me or have observed me, uh, uh, the work I do. But the one thing I can assure you is that at all times I work with my conscience and I try to do the right thing. I follow what the, the law says. And um, I do not have interest in who wins in an election. My interest in, is in that the process was properly con uh, uh, carried out. And whoever I win, uh, wins the election, then um, good luck to the person. So what has been your eye point? Uh, you know, something memorable that you won't forget, uh, you know, that, oh, uh, I'm so glad to have come into public service. What, 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 well, what were in, those? Well, insisting on the right things being done. Um, like I said, the election, the first election we had in Rivers, I had in Rivers State that we suspended. For a lot of people, it was, uh, it was strange. For a lot of people, it was strange that uh, election could be suspended simply because there was violence. And when we uh, said the election was suspended, some people question it that, oh, but it's happened in some other states that people even died. The result was still announced. So why is this one different? But we insisted that, well, we have to do things differently. And there was just no way we could have uh, uh, concluded that election given the level of violence that there was. Anyway, Obo Ifanga Esquire, you know, a lawyer, poet, author, Newspaper commentary, commentator, you know, uh, choir, <laughs> choir master. I'm not in the choir, interestingly. Interestingly, you are not in the choir, but yeah, you sing like us, it. you sing us him every Sunday. <laughs> Interesting. You need to join me this Sunday. <laughs> I have a croaky voice. Just anyway. Like mine. <laughs> anyway, thanks for opening the studio for us.
in 2022. We wish you the best of luck uh, in your remaining uh, period in the commission. You are still entitled to reappointment. We look forward to that. Uh, if uh, we pray the president will reappoint you so that you can have an extended service for to humanity. But best wishes in the new year in regards to your family. Thank you very much. So, we'll be back in a bit for the second and conclusive segment of Development Focus with GDO Joe. Please stay tuned. <laughs>